And here we go with broadcast. All right, good morning, everyone. We'll just have a few minutes for folks to get in, get connected, and we will start at nine o'clock sharp. Thank you for your time today for our webinar series. We'll just have about three minutes or so and then we'll get started. Looks like we've got folks jumping on. So that's great. Just give them a few more minutes. Yeah, I see some more folks coming in. They're saying hi. So we'll just wait another minute or so here. For those of you joining at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll have the ability to post a question for the end of the session or comments. And I'll repeat that again when we get started for the rest of the folks. So Cindy, about one more minute and then we'll jump in. Okay. If you're just joining us, we're going to get started soon here, just allowing a couple more people to jump in. All right, Cindy, I've got nine o'clock, so let's start promptly. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for the third of our series. We're doing a variety of webinars on different topics relating to the scaling up material of strategy, cash, execution, and people. Today, we're focusing on adapting processes from physical to virtual. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kane Petkovich. I am the partner of David Chavez. I'm also the COO and a coach, a leadership coach at Assured Strategy. My background is in uh, therapy and mental health and then moved into management. And what I found in my career is that combining the people knowledge and understanding the psychology of individuals has really helped in teaching other leaders how to support and manage their employees. So that's a bit about my background. Um, Cindy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, hello everyone. I'm Cindy Klingler. I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt. I have an extensive background in helping companies uh, of every size with uh, quality and process improvements. Our objective is to get operational effectiveness so that we can increase profits. And I hope today to provide you with some helpful, helpful information. We feel really blessed at a shared strategy to have Cindy because she has a long career of being the process improvement guru. And she brings a variety of expertise in different types of service industry as well as manufacturing industry organizations. So thank you, Cindy, for partnering with us for this workshop. Well, thank you for having me. So as um, our coaches, we have done some webinars to really help companies right now in looking at the current situation from a variety of different angles. 
So going back to the scaling up material, the four decisions, people, execution, strategy, and cash, we've broken out a four piece webinar series. On April 8th, we have a recording now available on our website of a workshop that Letitia, Ishmael, and I did really focusing on how to support employees in this current situation with their fears, their anxieties, their reactions to stress, and the long-term effect of acute stress, the symptoms of that, as well as tips and techniques to help motivate, coach, and mentor them during this type of situation. So if you have challenges with your employees, um, or the dynamics within your company's people, that's a great webinar to refer back to. Then last week we did a webinar um, led by David Chavez, who is our CEO and founder, also a strategy coach with many, many years of experience leading organizations in setting the strategy. Um, he comes back from a history of being a CPA, and he focused primarily on helping leaders right now think about cash management in this different type of dynamic where he's looking at possible ways of cash uh, management in a current crisis, as well as the difference between profitability um, and uh, looking at revenue, different types of, of cash conversations. So that webinar is available as well on our website. Today, we're really focusing on how to adapt and how companies have adapted from a physical environment into a virtual environment or a semi-virtual environment. So when we talk today, the physical environment really for, refers to their traditional company operations, whatever that would look like. A semi-virtual environment refers to the companies today who have some employees still in a physical location and other employees working from home, or a true virtual environment where everyone is, is working remotely. And then next week, we're going to have David Chavez and Ted Sarvata focus in on how companies can continue to maintain their long-term strategy in the context of needing to change operations or execution to um, pivot to what's going on in today's current dynamic. So we look forward to that webinar. If you haven't signed up for it, there's a link on our website to register. Again, all of these are complimentary. We're trying to do a service to the uh, community and they will be available on our website for those who cannot attend live. All right, let's get started. So today, the agenda is really looking at the conversation between taking operations from a process improvement perspective from the physical experience we had into the virtual or semi-virtual. And we're noticing that there's been three sort of phases of this process. The first phase was just get it done fast. Okay, so some companies had to pivot very quickly they might have gotten, one, one of our clients moved almost 300 employees into a virtual um, work from home environment in a week and a half. So at first, many companies were just reacting quickly a few weeks ago. Now we have new virtual norms that are developing and it's time for leaders to be thinking about how can we improve our virtual operations with a process improvement mindset so that, and find efficiency so that when we go back into what, whatever the new norm looks like, whenever that happens, we are taking some of the progress made um, and or applying the process improvement mentality into that transition. So that's sort of the journey of where we're going to go today in the webinar in terms of our agenda. All right, so in order to ground this whole conversation, we wanna make sure that we refer back to the core of business strategy, which is the purpose, the why of a company. And so I'm gonna have Cindy start about this concept and why it's so important to ground the conversation of process improvement and transitioning from virtual to uh, back into the physical from the perspective of maintaining your core, your why in the organization. Cindy? So I question whether you have um, provided clarity of your company's core process and how each of your stakeholders can contribute to meeting that purpose. So do they know the customer? Do they know the end product or service? Do they know the final use? Uh, who's the end user? Um, and all of these things relate back to your purpose. So do they know how valuable they are as individuals? So this is an opportune moment for you to share your core purpose with your employees and um, whether it's upstream and downstream and show them how important their roles are to meeting the customer expectation. I believe that right now individuals need to feel important. 
they need to feel like they're part of something and they really need to be aligned with leadership. So remind them often of the core purpose and how they can help to meet that purpose. And um, I think also if you were to let them know that the company is gonna come back strong and the company's growth prospects are still alive and well, this will all lend itself well to the well-being of the company overall. Uh, Kane, you want to? Yeah, and the other thing I want to add before we move on here is that next week when we're doing the webinar on strategy, it's really important to make sure that you're grounding all of the current decisions in the context of your core, your core customer, your core purpose, your core values. So we're going to be doing a deep dive into that next week, but this is foundational for businesses right now and leaders really need to stay focused on the core aspects of their organization strategy. All right, so <clears throat> we wanted to start off with a conversation about then versus now. Because in a traditional dynamic, before we were hit with, with the current situation, we would go into organizations and Cindy would do something called a gap assessment. And what that really is, is looking at a company's operations, their processes and their workflows, documenting those and looking at areas of waste or areas where the process was not running smoothly or effectively, and then working with leadership in the organization to help create an efficient workflow. And right now today, this dynamic has been flipped on its head because we are trying to have process improvement mentality, but in the context of a virtual world. So Cindy's gonna explain this from the context of what used to happen in terms of process improvement and how these steps relate now to a virtual environment. Cindy? So this is a, an assessment process map, and this is what it looks like in the world before the pandemic, when things were what we considered normal. So as you can tell by the red symbols and the orange uh, lines that represent redundant steps, this was not an efficient process. This actually had six times more steps than were necessary. They had eight stalls during the process. Um, so my question is, what would this look like in the virtual setting? So if each of these areas, these people were working from home, how would this play out? Well, I can't say for certain, but I guess that my guess is that it would add many delays. I think it would add a lot more uh, employee hassles, hassles for the vendor, and the outcome would be a complete stall. They may not receive their product. So when they did get back to normal operations, this is gonna be another area of problem because they won't be able to produce or, or serve their customers. So Kane, what happens next? Yeah, and it's important to just note that the, the processes that were messed up before you went into a virtual environment, you're taking that with you most likely, but this is prime time to be able to look at potential improvements. So Cindy, explain to us how you took that um, process flow and created efficiency and what that might look like in a virtual experience. So we looked at all the procedures, had to do some changes and had cut waste and redundancy. And now we have this, this obviously more smooth operation. And um, we were able to give back to two different departments about seven hours a week by making this change. So it's pretty significant. But today, if we were looking at this from a virtual setting, my feeling is that there would be no change. Had these improvements been made before, then this would be no different, very little different, if any. So you would be able to do this job and it would run smoothly and the outcome would be you'd have your product, there'd be less hassles for employees, there'd be um, less hassles for your vendor, keeping a better relationship with them. So my feeling is that if, if we can figure out ways right now to fix processes that were broken in the past, uh, if we have to go forward and continue with virtual work, it'll just be easier all the way around. And reverse of that is if we fix it now, as we go back, you'll be more profitable and have a lot less hassles. So, Kane, you want to lead us into the mindset? Yeah, so the whole intention of today's um, conversation is to help us understand how we can have a process improvement mindset in this virtual dynamic or semi-virtual dynamic 
to take back into the physical or whatever the new norm looks like, because there's certain components of process improvement, which we have an opportunity right now to look at because people um, are more flexible to change because we are forcing change quickly. So Cindy, we'll get into that a little bit, but we want to ground this conversation and what are the basics of needing to think about process improvement in the context of the current situation? So uh, I think without realizing it, because we are in this constant flux right now and changes are rampant, that we have actually uh, called on our workforce to become problem solvers. And the irony there is that teaching and encouraging people to be problem solvers is the first stage in lean, building a lean culture. So I would suggest we take advantage of that. People are getting more comfortable with change. They may not like it, but they're getting comfortable and getting used to it. So let's nurture that. And as we get back to normal business, this might stick, might hold. So, um, and it might be really important because I believe a lot of companies are gonna go back with reduced resources in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what this looks like at this point. And it, it may also be that a lot of these uh, changes become permanent. And I also think that if you um, use this as a continuous improvement idea, you'll be able to better meet your own core purpose uh, now and for the future. So I, I don't remember what was next, Kane. Yeah, I wanted to ground everyone on the call in some work that we do in scaling up. This comes from the scaling up system. And it's one of the things that we would typically do in an executive retreat. And I want to talk to everyone about how to take this and apply it into today's situation. So the intention of the functional accountability chart is for an executive team to each independently write down the name of the person or persons that they feel fall into the uh, person accountable for the function in the, in the company. And what we find in a normal dynamic before all of this is some situations where people will put more than one person in a box, or some teams actually think that different names are in a box, um, or some boxes are completely empty. And in a traditional retreat environment, we're processing this with the executive team to really look at some of the dysfunction of the accountability within a company's functions. And if you can imagine that there's, that there's confusion and disorganization with the executive team, how is that trickling down to the line staff? So right now in a virtual dynamic, it's more important than ever to pull out this form and what you'll notice is if we have a tool that we can send to you, there'll be a little tool symbol on the top left here. And, and then you can email us at info at assurestrategy.com and we'll make sure that we get these, these to you in a PDF format. But this is a tool right now that we're using with executive teams, even in this virtual environment, to really look at if and how roles might need to shift and change to better adapt to the current dynamics in an organization. So Cindy, what would you like to add with this? Well, I think managing a workforce from remote uh, for most leaders is new and uncharted territory. I also think that uh, we were expecting it to be short-lived. Most mm -hmm. people thought we were looking at two weeks. Now it's been what, a month or some, and some people even heading into six weeks. So I think that um, this is, we don't know what this is gonna morph into and the changes are, as I said earlier, they're rampant. So just as some employees are not disciplined enough to be working from home, some leaders are not capable of managing the work from home processes. So I think that more than ever using this form and going back to find out whether you've got the right people in the right seat, and I say doing as much of the right thing as they can. And the reason I say that is the right thing has changed too. We don't even know what that looks like in some cases. So. Um, you have to adopt new policies, you've modified procedures, and all of this has been done on the fly. So it's a really great time to revisit everyone's capabilities to assure that key functions are being covered by the best suited for the task. So if you um, have to change leadership roles, middle management positions, and bear in mind flexibility is your greatest asset right now. So you may have to repeat this process you know, we don't know what's gonna happen next week. We don't know what's gonna happen the week after that. You may have to go back and do this again and again during this crisis until things get back to whatever normal looks like. So I think it's just been 
also um, you might have leaders that wear more than one hat and maybe they're going to have to shift hats a little bit so that you've got the right person in the right seat. They may shift back after it's over and, and they may not. So, you know, I think that these changes could be temporary or, and they could be permanent. We just don't know. But the key here is to be watchful, uh, look for successes, look for failures, and be ready to revisit this tool as needed so that you can redirect people and get your uh, systems running optimally. So, Kane, I think the next thing we were gonna look at is staff performance. Yeah, and I just want to add before we jump into that, it's really important for leaders to have a contingency plan for what will happen if certain leaders in an organization do get ill and do need to step out or take care of family members. And so having this conversation with your executive team or your top leadership in an organization is super important because it might not be just about what's currently happening uh, in terms of who's covering these functions, um, who's accountable for that, but also what that succession plan or that coverage plan, that cross training plan might need to look like to position your company for long term success. Because the more prepared we are um, as a leadership team, the better we are able to lead our staff and then communicate that to the staff so they understand clearly who is sitting in these seats in this current situation and who's wearing those hats. All right, so I wanna talk about staff too, because typically in a general um, situation, we're supporting leaders in evaluating employees based upon two continuum. Their productivity at the bottom, which is um, how well they are doing um, and the tasks and the functions of the job, not how busy they are, how much busy work they have, but the function of the job, how productive are they? compared to their behaviors with core values in the organization. And those two dynamics, someone's productivity and how someone shows up with their character and their behaviors with peers um, and living the core values of an organization, those are two continuums that we use to look at A, B, and C players. And what we have found is that going into a virtual environment, staff performance may shift. So Cindy's gonna talk a little bit about how we can't assume that an A player in a physical environment is necessarily going to translate to an A player in a home environment. There's a lot of things going on right now that might be impacting people's ability to focus, concentrate, um, interruptions, and conversely, people who might have been underperforming might find a lot of efficiency and um, operational improvements or um, living the core values differently, showing up in new ways when they're in a home environment. So Cindy, share with us some of the experiences that you're seeing here. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, that we have a client that moved about 300 people uh, up to a virtual environment within about a week and a half. Mm -hmm. And one of their executives told me that the only reason that happened was because they had a large number of uh, employees that were pretty tech savvy step forward and, and offer to help. And in a lot of cases, they were surprised because these people were not A players. They weren't even being looked at for future advancement. And they stepped up and they helped other people who were less tech savvy get navigate the changes to get toward working from home. So um, I think that you'll just see that some people will step up and bring their A game like you've never seen before. And others that, have been A players, they're going to falter. Their performance may fall short, and uh, you know what from what you've expected from them in the past. Uh, I think one benefit from using this tool is to help you gain insight into these shifts. Yeah. Uh, it may be something that it it may be something. Excuse me, just to take a one on one meeting with them to help them with course corrections, and it may be that they need to be reassigned. So. Keep this in mind too. I talked about flexibility. You may not get this right the first time. We may have to revisit that just like the other tool number of times. Uh, I, I just believe this will open your eyes to um, ex those people that have hidden talents and they have gone unnoticed possibly for a long time. Similarly, um, you'll find individuals that lack the capabilities and we've been making demands of them all along that they just couldn't live up to. So I think that this time, although it's a hard time to get through, I think this could give us some opportunities to really move forward in a positive way. So I have to ask, I wonder how many companies out there have actually defined their core values and 
um, if they haven't, you know, you have to know that your people are making it up as they go along. So I think this causes a misalignment. So um, that's about all I have for that, Kane. All right, and just to make sure everyone knows, we're going to dive deeper again into core values in next week's webinar on Wednesday at nine o'clock, because that's part of, of a company strategy. And also we mentioned this tool in our first webinar when we were looking at how to help manage and support employees during a time of crisis. So you can refer back to that webinar as well to learn more about this tool. And again, in a time of crisis, people's behaviors change. And so we can't assume that the type of behaviors we're used to with employees are automatically translating into a virtual or semi-virtual environment. It's really important to continue to use this tool to provide feedback and mentorship and coaching for our employees. All right, let's move on now, looking at waste. So in a traditional environment, <clears throat> these are the types of waste that we would be focusing on if we were going in and doing a gap assessment. But in a virtual environment, some of these are more or less relevant. So Cindy's gonna talk a bit about um, what these different wastes are and how this is translating into a pro process improvement mindset in the virtual world. So let's start with grounding them, Cindy, in the physical um, space of what the traditional wastes are. So in this, in the world that I live in, I would be performing a gap assessment to determine all of these areas. We'd map out operations the way we want them to look like. And then we would find our defects and we would find where the delays and stalls are. Um, we would find where there are people that are not functioning properly and it could be poor training. It could be that they're uh, not suited to the job. Uh, we would find that we've over controlled our production and, and have excess inventories, um, way too many process steps. And oftentimes we have a um, something that David talks about is are you giving the customer what they need or what they want? And oftentimes when you're giving them what they want, you're over-processing. You're doing things that really don't add any value to the customer at all. So we look at all of those areas and come up with, like I said, our mapping so that we can eliminate defects, reduce unnecessary and redundant steps, um, get rid of the system delays and meet our customers' expectations more profitably. But in a virtual setting, I, or semi-virtual even, um, while processes are in flux, looking at all of these areas, um, trying to remove deficiencies may be much more difficult or even impossible to measure. So through the adaptation of work from home, uh, resources and process changes become essential in order to maximize the current state of operation, keep things flowing as best you can. So the inclusion of these changes uh, can they be incorporated to establish new and improved business standards is what we need to be thinking about. That's got to be what we're looking at today. So if, if you knew you had problems in the past and you, you didn't fix them, which is very common right now because we were, in, we were fat. Things were going well. And when things are going well, oftentimes we'd say, well, we'll get to that later. Well, we didn't get to it. So right now we have to figure out what we can do to fix those problems moving forward. And I just think that the opportunity has just knocked on the door. We're, we're, we're here and we can take the time to fix these things as we get back to work. So the challenge is sorting out what perceived defects existed before the crisis, what wastes have become part of the business now because of the crisis, and then how do we determine what we can eliminate, what we can reduce or minimize, and what is better left alone right now until things get back to whatever normal looks like? So I, I have to ask the question, what can we learn from this? And how do we make these corrections and how do we make them sustainable? So Kane, we were gonna look at virtual defects next. Yeah, and, and um, what, what I would like to say about virtual um, defects as you get started on this is we have to remember to keep the core customer in mind. And that's what gets back to our strategy for next week is core customer, core values, and core purpose. These are all going to be super important to keep in mind as we're looking at what we're gonna focus on for process improvements or not right now. It has to be in the context of the core customer experience. So go ahead, Cindy, we're on virtual defects. So 
I'm talking about virtual, but I'm also talking about semi-virtual because I would say a good number of the clients we're working with are doing both. Mm -hmm. And so um, as we navigate uh, our operations from the normal workplace to multiple virtual environments and trying to figure out how to accommodate distancing in the, in the physical workplace, possibly having to modify work schedules and refit workflows, um, we created a need for leaders to take a closer look at their current state on a constant basis, um, looking at various functions to make sure that they're operating right. And in order to uh, do, do this, they have to affect change and they have to affect change on the fly. They have to do it rapidly and adapt and people have to adapt. And we talked about that earlier. People are kind of used to change right now. It's, it's part of our, our everyday norm. So in an essential workplace, most companies have reduced workforce. Their teams have been split. Um, their remaining um, people in the workplace are under strenuous conditions such as distancing, uh, wearing masks. Um, their support staff, HR and, and whoever else that, that they need to lean on, they're not there. So they have to find other means of, of getting information. Um, for those working remotely, uh, they might have different equipment at home, different computer, different layout. They have um, more than likely their workspace is less conducive to accomplishing their tasks. They also have to perform their job in a lot of cases simultane simultaneously with being a teacher of their, to their children. Um, and, then, and then I look at if both partners are working from home, now you've got overcrowding, <laughs> you've got um, complete disruption of the household. And I also hear from a lot of people in work and personal environments that they're having a really rough time as couples working or being together 24 seven. This is causing an extra strain. So all of these things are a huge effect from going virtual. Um, also in the semi-virtual environment, you know, how do we control distancing, keep people six feet apart? when our processes are designed to have us working shoulder to shoulder. And then if your employees have to wear masks and some counties and, and areas are requiring that, does that inhibit their visual acuity? acuity? Um, that can make it unsafe conditions and it also can increase the probability of errors. So, um, and then you look at some employees, they're, uh, they're afraid to get close to their coworkers. So all of that's going on. And um, so all of these situations lead to inefficiencies and slowing down the system. So leaders have to be ready to ask their people questions, include them in the day-to-day -day and, and come up with methods to get the workflows back on whatever the new track is. Um, and also your deliverables are gonna change. And I think the big thing there is to be able to communicate your expectations to your employees so they know what the, the expectations are, but also to your customers um, and be realistic. You know, this is the new deliverable. This is what it's gonna look like right now so that everyone's expectations are the same. And then, you know, I will say that people in general today are being more accepting. They understand things aren't normal. And so they're gonna be able to adapt to that. But you have to talk to them. You have to let them know. It's really important that, that they're not left in the dark that's when they're gonna lose it. So, um, and, and remember one other thing that's important here is that you have to be sharing the same message. So you're sharing the same message with your team and your customers and making sure that all of your team is sharing the same message with the customers. It's really important. And um, just to finish this up, you'll most likely see an increase in, in these efficiencies. It, it, I don't think it can be helped right now. Um, people's emotions have been hijacked their thoughts. So they're operating in this very unusual and, and um, unpredictable state. And I think this also adds a new level of risk that management has to watch for, for potential problems to arise. And um, so I think in order to reduce uh, some of these issues, you know, I have a few recommendations, but put your people first, let them know that you put them first, that their safety and their health is the most important thing. And then be prepared to reroute activities and redirect it um, at, on the fly. Be, be very, very flexible 
uh, change assignments and add or remove functions as needed um, based on, on the present value to the customer. So you have to kind of figure that out. We used to do X, and now we need to go do Z. How is that going to affect the customer? And that's what Kane mentioned earlier, is keeping your core customer in the forefront of all these decisions. So be sure um, also that all of your people have a point of contact. Because with, with the virtual changes and everyone's gone home, how do we get a hold of someone when I've got a, well, got a problem? I can't continue with my job because something stopped me. Who do I get a hold of and how do I get a hold of them? And if I can't get a hold of them, then who's next in line? So you've got to make sure you have that point of contact information available to them. And I said it earlier, listen. You know, listen to the voice of your people, listen to their hassles, uh, listen to their ideas. Sometimes they know more than management does about what, what needs to be done. Uh, Kane, let's head into delays. All right. So um, I think delays are the larger picture of the new norm. They're probably the biggest problem we have. Mm -hmm. And especially if you had um, stalls and delays in your processes before, now it's going to be that much worse. And so much of it today we can't control. It, it's out of our hands. You know, if, if you have suppliers that are shut down and you're semi-virtual, uh, you, you still can't get supplies, you're still stuck, you can't get the job done. So, you know, from the, the work at home environment, not all of our information has been transferred to electronic format. There's still uh, do documents and data and information that's in hard copy in a filing cabinet back at the office. So if you need that information in order to make a decision, you know, what are you gonna do? So this is gonna create an, a stuck. This is gonna create a slowdown or a, a stall and whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, also, much of the workforce today, I would say those the, with the wisdom of the years of experience are um, our biggest concern from the health standpoint. So they have to stay home. And so they may not be available to us virtually for various reasons. So I have a little real quick story to tell you here. Uh, one of our essential clients uh, had a production issue come up and none of the people on the line had ever seen this before. So they reached out to the resident experts who was at home and he couldn't get his head wrapped around their explanation verbally. He needed to see it. So they went and took pictures and sent him the pictures. Well, not being tech savvy, he couldn't download them or upload them, whichever the case. And so he gets his daughter to help him and then he gets the pictures and he looks them over as a phone call with the team and, and gets them online and they figure out what to do to fix the problem so they can move on. So th the problem is, is that in the physical world that would have taken five minutes, they have walked over to his office, asked the question, got the answer and moved on. In this case, it took over two hours for them to get this resolved. So you think about that in terms of every single little thing that's happening today. Those are situations that are just out of our control. It's just gonna be that way, and we have to figure out how to uh, adapt to it. Um, so I, I think in order to mitigate some of the problems for the increase in delays, um, we have to just, I keep going back to communication, but communication with suppliers, uh, we have a, an, um, a client that that's the first thing they did. They, they got back to work, um, got on the horn and started calling all their suppliers, working out extended payment arrangements, working out what they were going to do for deliveries, and really, really put a lot of effort into that to make sure that they could keep rolling. And it, it worked. So that communication is really, really huge. And I also said earlier is about setting your new expectations. So set those for both internal and external uh, customers. Communication. Um, if you're gonna have delays, let the employees know and, and then redirect them to do something else. And also let the customers know so they're ahead of it. And I think that this is the most important thing you can do right now. So, 
Anyway, Kane, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, just two quick stories. We had a, a client who was considered to be an essential business and, but their vendor didn't know that they were thereby also an essential business because they were the supplier of that, of that client of ours. So they, that, that vendor was in the process of thinking they needed to shut down operations because their primary client was going to be going away. And so that conversation is so critical because if you don't communicate with your suppliers and your vendors and who, and who is in your production chain or your service provision chain, then they might not know that they are an essential part and they are able to support you still. So again, taking the initiative and reaching out to the people in your whole business's workflow is so critical right now. And then the other, the other story I was thinking about is the fact that in a real life environment, you can pop down to someone's office and ask a quick question to keep something moving along. In a virtual environment, some of the executives I'm working with are frustrated because they are having to schedule an appointment on a calendar in order to talk about things because the quick pop-in is no longer available and people aren't scheduling five minute check-ins or five minute conversations. They're scheduling 15, 20, 30 minute, an hour long meetings. So their calendars are getting blocked out. So it's just interesting that some of the things we took for granted in terms of keeping the process moving along or decision making moving along in an organization are interrupted right now. And we have to talk about it as an executive team um, because we're just assuming we need to make appointments, but maybe teams get together a couple times a day for a quick five minute check-in just to make some, some quick decisions to keep things moving. So that availability has really shifted and it's a different mindset now. So those are a couple things I was thinking about as it relates to our client stories. There was right. another one. There oh, was yeah, another story. Yeah, there was another story too that um, we talked about earlier. One of our clients, they just didn't quite get get it on get on it fast enough, and so they sent a like four hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to a university that was closed. So the next thing they know, they're doing mad, the mad scramble because they don't know where the equipment is. It's a pretty expensive thing to lose. So it took them a few days and then they found out where it was located and, and, and got it straightened out. So then I asked the uh, executive I was talking to, I said, so you know where it is now, what are you gonna do about it? And they weren't sure. There was some issues with the logistics for the trucking company and they just didn't know where it was gonna end up and that was worrisome. Yeah. So yeah. It's Delays in all sorts of areas is what we're finding. Yeah. All right, let's move into um, underutilized talent because this is definitely something that we talked about earlier a little bit, but it's important right now in terms of the context of waste and how we think about it in our organizations. Yeah, I like to call this instead of underused, um, I refer to it as misuse because it works both ways. Sometimes you have people that are, um, are not able to do their job because we haven't trained them properly or we haven't um, really taken time to do that assessment and find out whether they're sitting in the right chair. So I think that's a, a part of the problem. The other is you have people that have talent that we haven't recognized and we have never given them any authority. They can't make any decisions. So they're, they're doing much less than they could for the company mm -hmm. and they're probably pretty unhappy about it. So um, I think that it, you know, if, you're, if you're watching those people right now that are stepping up in this time frame, this is the time to engage them and talk to them and find out where, where do they want to be? Mm -hmm. you know, where are they going in the future? What's their plan? Because oftentimes people won't come and tell you. You, know, you have to have to pull it out of them. So I, I think that if we take the time to do that and then recognizing those people that are not capable, figuring out where they could be placed. You know, we don't necessarily want to get rid of people. So what would they be better at? And then this goes back to that assessment. Yeah. That, uh, that, yeah, we were talking about earlier. So um, I wonder too if, if sometimes have you, you know, have you meted out those people? in the team that can really navigate um, through these changes. It, that might be someone that's really a strong leader and, and could really be nurtured 
and, and moved up the scale of the ladder. Um, also, we talked earlier about um, assessing people on their value, but how do you determine their best placement? And I think that's another uh, type of evaluation that needs to be um, assessed. And um, um, anyway, these two, the two forms that you talked about earlier is, should come into play at this time to make those determinations. So anyway, yeah, absolutely. you've probably heard, you've probably heard more came from, a, from people in this area. It's been interesting. I recently did a leadership training and the, the group of about 35 people talked about how they were finding that their skill sets were challenged and or enhanced in a virtual environment. So some people were getting more effective, more efficient, getting more work done. Backed projects were getting done because of less interruptions and the autonomy to work alone and, and have an environment that had um, less people, you know, coming in into their, their office and, and talking to them throughout the day. And other people were feeling really isolated feeling extremely um, separated from the team. It was impacting their ability to focus. Um, they were finding that they were struggling in that virtual environment. So again, it gets back to these forms. We can't assume that someone's function and their productivity and their de demonstration of core values in an organization is going to translate from a physical world into a semi-virtual world or a virtual world. So looking at our employees and supporting and and coaching and mentoring during this time is really important. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's, ama it's amazing because some people have a real struggle being by themselves. And other people talk to me about they, they have no routine. They don't know what day it is. And they're, so they're fidgety and, it's, and they can't sit down and focus. So they get up and wander around and you know, do laundry and do other things, but they, they can't get back to focus. So that's happening quite a bit right now. Yeah, so that first webinar we did on helping to manage employees through a crisis to support, coach, and mentor them, we get in a lot um, in terms of this conversation, so that's a, a webinar you can refer back to. All right, Cindy, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Excessive movement of process so, in the virtual environment. All right, so you've got a lot of new processes going on or change processes. So how how are they flowing and are they creating more bottlenecks so with the work from home environment um did we end up adding steps did we end up taking steps away um do we have a handle on it and and if you've got 300 people working in in all in different places how do you bring that in into a control zone how are you going to do that so under the present circumstances, um, there are a couple things I think we need to pay attention to. And I, I realized myself the other day, I was talking to someone and I thought, you know something, the, they're um, so out of sync with the standard procedure. They don't know what that is anymore. Mm -hmm. And if management hasn't taken the time to make sure they define that for them, I think people are going to do um, what we talk about in, in um, scaling up is it's, you get that path and they can make their own decision as to what to do. And I think that's happening quite a bit. Standard operating procedures aren't what they were yesterday. So um, they're adding steps, um, they're removing steps, and the processes are getting completely out of balance. So we, um, we as leaders, we need to make sure that those standard operating procedures have been modified and people are clear on them, or you're gonna have a lot of extra steps or missing steps, whichever the case. So um, I also think in, in all fairness, with all the confusion and everything that's going on, our leaders are also caught up in their own whirlwind. Like you mm -hmm. were talking about them, all the meetings and all the emails. You know, I had one, one of our clients tell me she was off on a Friday and a, and a Monday and she came back Tuesday and had over 400 emails to answer. Well, how can you get anything done? You know, so that's, that's off the charts. So anyway, I'm always surprised though, when, you know, leaders start to evaluate processes and they start seeing it for what it is. Uh, you do the, the process map, maybe you do it with sticky notes up on the wall and you see this process and I'll see the executive's mouth drop. Why are we doing that? <laughs> when did that happen? They have no idea 
how these processes are flowing. So I said it earlier, this is really a good time to start looking at that. And, and uh, you know, hopefully you can see what changes need to be made. So also watch what's happening in, in the case of, of asking questions and dealing with your, your team, you know, this may be virtual, you may have to be on screen with them to do this. But I think you can take the time um, to evaluate what's going on, but you need to listen. You need to listen to them. And this is what I see and hear all the time. The people on the line know where the inefficiencies are. They know where there's steps that they consider stupid. We don't even know why we do this. It adds no value. They know it. And they really look at management and wonder, why do you guys don't know this? <laughs> you know, so this is a big disconnect. So um, take time. Take the time to talk with them. Take the time to get to know what they're doing. Ask the question, what are you doing? Well, why do you do that? And that's going to teach you a lot about that operation. So ask questions and their answers may surprise you and they may be able to take those as permanent improvements down the road to eliminate steps and get the workplace to be more efficient all the way around, get better workflow. So Kane, next. Yeah, we had one client talk about how their IT department was feeling like the heroes because the yeah. IT huh. department had been pushing for certain improvements from a process improvement perspective for months, if not years, but it wasn't prioritized before this crisis. And now they were able to roll out very quickly the things that they knew from an IT perspective would bring enhancement to the effectiveness of the organization's workflow because now they were the hero to come in and solve problems in order to create the opportunity for people to work in a virtual dynamic. So again, we are finding that there's a lot of positives that are coming out of organizations when they're forced to change because people inherently do not like change. We like our routines. But when we're in a crisis mindset, sometimes we push through that natural resistance and we can really take back some positives into our new, new norm. So I we, told, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Kane. I told you this morning uh, um, of another uh, case that was really surprising. It's even hit bureaucracy. Uh, California State in, in, um, Unemployment Development Department or Employment Development Department has always sent out a, a form in the mail you fill it out and you send it back to them they do this every two weeks for everyone on unemployment well look at this crisis how many people now are on unemployment well as effective today you can do that um, online so would that would that have ever happened <laughs> anyway yeah crazy so let's get into some of the tips um, of moving from a physical to a virtual and also then trying to take those improvements back into the physical. So the first one is communication plan. Cindy? Um, I think you need to focus on a communication plan. And, you know, that becomes a process in itself. So um, we need better tools right now more than ever. We seem to be getting more bogged down. I think it's funny because we have all of this advancement in electronics and we can, we can do these meetings via Zoom and all this stuff and, and emails, but we're so bogged down. And it seems some to me that you've got to come up with a communication plan that's going to work for you. Uh, we have a um, client and we put together a procedure for emails to try and keep the internal emails under some sort of control. And, uh, uh, you know, everyone's going to have to do this their own way. Everybody's teams work differently, but this is really important at this point in time. So um, you're, you're going to have to include all employees. You're going to have to figure out what it is that, that's going to allow you to spread whatever message you need to spread out there for all of them. Um, I think also part of the communication today is to check in daily as a minimum. You know, we talk about the uh, huddles. Uh, one of our clients, said that they've got huddles going. Um, this is the one with the roughly 300 people working you know, from home. They, they have daily huddles and up and down the scale. And they said it's very, very helpful. Um, also, we heard in another webinar that it was a good thing to check out at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. check in and check out is a good idea. Um, 
leadership has to be on the same page too. You know, what, what is your message and how are you delivering it? That has to be something you make clear as part of your plan. Um, include the element of listening. Take more time to listen. We talked about that earlier to the voice of, of the employee and your customer, very important. Um, keep your messages clear, keep them simple, keep them consistent um, and very specific. Let's not, let's not lose people in the process. And consider um, adding what we call a social time, a virtual social time. Um, they call it virtual hangouts. Um, what is it, to have happy hours and all that type of stuff? Yeah, we're hearing that's that. Something, yeah, that's, that's cute. In fact, I, I had a, a, one of our clients tell me that they, the night before we talked, his whole family had dinner together virtually. So they all set up screens and shared dinner. It's pretty cute. Anyway, um, avoid meeting stew. Let's stay out of the weeds because right now it's really easy to lose the, our folks' attention. So um, you move on to the next one, Kane. Yeah, I want to talk briefly about um, the importance of redefining people's roles right now. And again, that goes back to the forms we talked about earlier. You can't assume that someone's roles and the expectations of their performance are going to be the same from the physical to the virtual. So the communication around this is really important. Also, one of the most misused leadership words is accountability. And there's actually three different words that describe how sometimes people in loose conversation use this terminology. Accountability is the person who is responsible for counting information and giving it voice. So they might accumulate data and speak to the data's results. And if the data is off track, then they're screaming loudly to make sure people are understanding the significance of the results. So they're giving information voice. Responsibility is action. This is the person or people who are doing the task or taking action to get something done. And authority are the people who are, have the ability to make a decision. And I can tell you time and time again, we go into organizations and leadership is not using these words correctly and they're confusing their employees. So it's really important right now in a virtual environment to make sure employees know who is accountable, who is responsible and who has authority in this different dynamic. So one of the most important things you can communicate is the clarity of, of these terms. All right, and yeah. then as I mentioned earlier, um, we've got about five minutes left, Cindy, so we're gonna keep moving, okay. is, is the, um, the hero of the IT team. So I'll let you speak about that. So um, what I suggest at this point is make sure you have a qualified and competent IT team. Because with everyone on virtual equipment, I mean, they're gonna need help. You know, we know within the workplace, things crash and fail and uh, so trying to take care of 300 people remotely, I can't even imagine. So my, my thinking is if you're a larger company, an internal uh, team is the best. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I say that is that our outsources, our IT outsources are overwhelmed mm -hmm. right now and not getting back to companies as fast as they should. So if you have internal people, that's going to be the best. But in, in any case, you've got to have someone on standby to help people because things are going to fail. Yeah, um, and the other thing, Cindy, we're noticing is that you can have different employees who are not traditionally a part of an IT team become an ad hoc support staff. Yeah. That yes. peers can really help support each other. Yes. Uh, let's move on to the SMART goals and hassle logs. So in a normal dynamic, we're having executives and leaders in an organization define SMART goals. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And we write goals in an X to Y by when fashion. So right now, we might need to be asking our leaders to simplify goals, get back to basics, help communicate goals very clearly to employees so they have clear expectations right now. And also the hassle log. So part of the Rockefeller habits that we work with in um, scaling up is taking um, measurement of customer hassles, the voice of the customer and employee hassles. And, and those are tracked. Right now in a virtual environment, those hassles might be different. 
we can't assume that the customers are having the same hassles now that they had in the past. So it's really important right now in this virtual environment that you're keeping hassle logs of both your customer voice and your employee voice to make sure you're responding to the current situation. The next one um, is core values, core purpose, and core customer. And again, we can't reiterate this enough and we'll cover this next week in the next webinar. All of the decisions right now, if you keep them through the lens of the core of the company, then you will empower employees to act in the moment and make maybe decisions in the moment because they need to keep things moving along. And as long as they're making them through this lens, then you have a better chance of a good decision than if an employee is not clear on these things. So again, we're gonna cover this in depth next week, but we can't stress enough the importance of making sure that all employees are very clear on the company core values and what that means behaviorally, the core purpose, the why of the company, and who their core customer is, keeping the customer experience in mind during these process changes. And the last one, Cindy, I'll let you talk about is what you're, you're coining virtual open door. So um, as leaders, you should expect the same level of professionalism, productivity, and adherence to the company core values and the core purpose. So encourage problem solving, collaboration, and above all communication, um, like reporting problems immediately. So you, what I said was you should change your open door policy to a call me or text me policy. So virtual open door, keep the communication going. Yeah, and in, in closing, we really just wanna make sure that everybody is keeping in mind that as leaders, we've gone from just get it done fast, make this happen as quickly as possible, to now what is the new virtual norm? But we want people's mindsets to be what can we take from this experience and bring the efficiency and the effectiveness that we're gaining into our new norm when we go back into the office or go back to our physical work environments. Because right now is opportunity. We might have to look at process improvement with a little different mindset than what we would traditionally do when we go into an organization. But there is no time like the present to think about this and then take that into um, your, your normal operations. So we really appreciate everyone's time with us today. Cindy is making herself available to um, provide a free coaching call to anyone who wants to talk to her about the specifics of their company or their challenges or their process improvement um, situation. So if you would like to talk to Cindy, please email us at info at assuredstrategy.com and we would be happy to connect you with her. Um, again, we're at our time. So if there's any questions that we didn't obviously have a chance to get to, we will um, get back to you. So please email us those questions at info at assuredstrategy.com and we will for sure get Cindy to respond. Uh, Cindy, thank you for your time today. We really value you in our firm. You're an amazing coach. And I know that if anyone decides to reach out for support, that, that you will be able to, to help them. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> All right, take care everyone, stay safe. Take care everyone, stay hopeful. <laughs>